Karen Emmons, uh, Professor Seek, uh, for I guess lecture series. Every five years, each college on Ball State's campus has the opportunity of hosting an Emmons professor or Emmons professors for a year. In our case this year, we're hosting three different Emmons professors, one assigned really to each department for one quarter for the year. It's quite an honor uh, to have here with us tonight uh, President uh, John Emmons' uh, widow, and I would like uh, Mrs. Emmons to stand and be recognized if, if you would. <laughs> We remember President Emmons through the Emmons professorships, which have been funded mainly with funds from uh, donated by faculty on the campus. We remember him uh, through the uh, Emmons scholarships and through the uh, growth of this university from 1,000 students to some uh, uh, 15,000 students during uh, his time as president of the university. It's, very, it's a very nice honor to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Constance Perrin to you tonight. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago, a master's degree in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Chicago, and in 1975, uh, a Doctorate of Philosophy in Anthropology from the American University. She has been a Guggenheim Fellow, she has been a Ford Fellow, she has been an Anthony Stevenson Fellow, and she has been a Fulbright Fellow to the University of London. She has written extensively, including uh, a time as Managing Editor and Director of Publications for the American Institute of Planners and for the AIP Journal. She has two extremely important books to her credit. The latest in 1977 was Everything in Its Place, Social Order and Land Use in America, published by the Princeton Press. And in 1970, she wrote With Man in Mind, an interdisciplinary perspectives for environmental design that has been published and, and uh, circulated by the MIT Press. In terms of architectural education, she served as a, a researcher on the 1966 Princeton Study of Architectural Education. She has lectured at more than a dozen schools across the uh, country. She represents the allied professions on the National Architectural Accrediting Board, and she goes to a meeting in a several weeks in Asheville, North Carolina, where she will uh, vote on the accreditation for the College of Architecture and Planning's program in architecture. She has just returned from being a member on this year's Progressive Architecture Annual Awards Jury. She is a fellow of the American Anthropological Association. She serves on the board of the board of directors of the Environmental Design Research Association. It's an extreme honor for this college to have uh, one of uh, America's most outstanding uh, professionals in the field of environmental design, uh, Dr. Constance Perry. Connie. <laughs> Um, it may be, I, I can't talk about either my accrediting board duties, I can't talk about what happened at the Progressive Architecture Jury, so uh, I'm making up for it by having a rather long discussion to share with you tonight. I thought of offering us a seventh inning stretch, and 
if I see any majors getting restless, uh, maybe we can do that. Uh, tonight, what I want to do is share with you some ideas and perspectives on American culture that will probably be somewhat new to you, or uh, even foreign. I think of that only because they've been strange thoughts for me to have had. Uh, strange in the sense that they have not been regarded as part of the current perspectives on how and why metropolitan areas are organized as they are. Those perspectives which are shared by sociologists, architects, planners, landscape architects, economists, journalists, political scientists, these are really a sort of set of current paradigms uh, that the several professions taking a sustained interest in urban and regional development have. The other thing I'm going to be saying will replace those paradigms. To the contrary, my work in American culture is intended to deepen those perspectives in the hope that still more might be mined out of them. In my new book, Everything in Its Place, I have tried to weave together these two ways of looking at the same reality. In hopes of evoking more than meets the eye, I work as what somebody has called a professional complicator of those things that we take pretty much for granted. For that reason, I'm going to speak to you uh, tonight without any slides, which is still another foreign notion for this hall, perhaps. Um, despite the absence of those stimuli, I hope that as you hear me, you will allow yourself to visualize examples out of your own experiences. I have the perhaps mistaken idea that because the visual world is so readily accessible to us, it tends to dominate and perhaps obscure our focus on the world of meaning. Meanings are my subject. It is to the meanings of metropolitan land use arrangements that I want to direct our attention. And correctly or not, I think these meanings will become overt only by looking more inwardly than outwardly, by examining with care our own tacit assumptions and understandings. They are what I regard as the constituents of American culture. These assumptions and understandings are realized in brick and concrete out there all around us. Rather than concentrating on the manifest symbols, I want to examine their social meanings. And besides that, I'm not a very good photographer. The study of shared assumptions and understandings is the study of culture, but more usually that of peoples living elsewhere and living differently. Worldviews, beliefs about the origin of the universe, understandings of right and wrong behavior, these are the problems of the cultural anthropologist and historian. We are more accustomed to reports of alien and exotic practices and of past events. An archaeology of contemporary social thought is only gradually becoming developed, and certain techniques adapted from semantics. Uh, and some of these techniques have been worked out, especially by scholars in Bloomington, are helpful in the particular and difficult problem of studying one's own society in the here and now. It's difficult because the study of other societies by people foreign to it takes place with a built-in set of contrasting ideas. I, on the other hand, had to forge my own source of surprise mired as I am in the definitions, categories, and assumptions of this culture. To see it all, never mind seeing it sharply, some tools of research especially honed to that particular problem are essential. So my discussion tonight will dwell for a bit on the question of method, as well as on such things as I have found out. One question has continued to preoccupy me under the general heading of environmental planning and design. How we think about what we think about. About 12 years ago, I began by asking, if we want to plan the physical environment to reflect people's needs and interests, 
what I did with those people, we should be studying. But the fact was that despite all the goodwill in the world, that is when it wasn't entirely lacking, many understandings and insights of human scientists had not been re-expressed in the built environment. Whatever we knew about human scale was all too often ignored in three dimensions. In, with man in mind, I took that fact as a problem of thought. But there must be something about planning and architecture on the one hand, and the human sciences on the other, preventing their happy collision and collusion. I undertook an epistemology of sorts in order to develop a vocabulary of concepts with which they might come into closer talking and working distance. My simple lessons in that book deal with the problem of translating two-dimensional thought about people, words on paper, figures in a column, into three places and spaces responsive to human use. In everything in its place, social order and land use in America, I look not at ideas that should be involved in environmental design, but at those that are. Ideas that govern the production of the places and spaces of metropolitan areas, examining them as indigenous American beliefs and ideas. This book is based in part on interviews with mortgage bankers, developers, property appraisers, architects and planners, government officials, civic leaders, politicians, people actively engaged in making metropolitan development happen. I argue that although they compose a particular interest group, they express social thoughts we all share. And so I treat these interviews with these practitioners as texts of American culture. Shortly, I will get down to an extended discussion with you of some of them. But first, I want to situate this eccentric approach to a set of very familiar problems. Sociologists and economists customarily address the physical and social environment through such themes and variables as socioeconomic characteristics of the population, housing supply and demand, the location of employment, migration, and efficiency and equity in the distribution of public goods and services. They also consider the special situations of certain groups, such as the elderly, the poor, the handicapped, and so on. When architects and planners practice their crafts and art, they deal with issues such as housing density, the relationships among land uses, the requirements of the life cycle. Lawyers and political scientists working on issues of metropolitan development are often concerned with environmental quality and with exclusionary zoning as a form of racial and income discrimination, as well as with issues of intergovernmental relations. Working from an anthropological perspective, I have looked for the tacit assumptions underlying those themes, variables, and the ever-present issues. For it has seemed to me that not only with all the goodwill in the world, but with enormous expenditures of money and talent, actual patterns of metropolitan development have been recreating problems as intractable as ever. Continuing inequities in the allocation of public goods and services, as well as the dishonoring of civil rights laws in housing and employment. For the effort made in defining and analyzing such issues, practice just has not yielded commensurate results. It seemed to me that something else must be at work to reproduce the same patterns, the same problems. When most attention has been given to physical and social change, mine has been with a lack of it. The persistence of so many patterns and the opportunities for change during periods of recent growth have been so great. Our tacit assumptions and premises and the categories falling from them are the means by which we see the world as we do. And in anthropology, they are themselves the subject of investigation. I have set, to, set out to unearth some of them and to discover what keeps them going in my own society. They constitute our cultural apparatus, with, which undergirds even what we tend to think of as the fundamentals of our society, <clears throat> our laws and institutions. Our cultural apparatus manufactures the metropolitan landscapes of today and will produce those of tomorrow. 
and it has as well helped to put out those studies in which we rely for understanding. Doing this kind of study at home poses many problems not to be found abroad in an alien and exotic society whose cultural apparatus comes clear just for having been put alongside the one we know by Lydia. By definition, a pure, literate, and democratic industrial society contains every shade of opinion and attitude, and assumptions of many kinds abound. Analysis often forms, therefore, around the construct interest group to account for the different ways people see social and political issues. Instead, to discover more than meets the eye about the American system of land use, I have stayed very close to the cultural texts I collected, examining their contexts in order to find the meanings of the assumptions being used. My method is structural, hardly used in these days of so many structuralisms, but appealed unfamiliarly in this case to a major institution and to the public business of my own society. I use it as a discovery procedure to identify the cultural logic underlying what it is we take for granted. It is one method for putting words to that which ordinarily goes without saying, and for learning more about the meanings and sources of everyday signs and symbols. Culture, as I define it, is a system of perceived differences used to give meaning to the world. Analysis has the task of proposing how these differences are related to one another and why they are as they are. All domains of life are organized or structured by sets of distinctions, which work together to provide meaning to the whole. Breakfast, as the first meal of the day, will be defined by its differences from lunch and dinner. In terms of food, the sequence in which it is eaten, and the social setting, as will each meal be distinguished from one another. Now, an English breakfast carries a particular meaning to us because of its differences from an American breakfast, but it equally is defined by its relationship to, that is, its differences from, all other English eating times, morning tea, lunch or dinner, afternoon tea, supper or dinner. Sunday lunch would stand out from all others, and so the days of the week as well as times of day would become important. A structural analysis of English meals would be based on the menus of each, identifying the arrangement of differences between and relationships among foods offered at each time. Those differences and relationships would provide the findings of a structural analysis. They could also be termed the rules of the English meal system. These rules or principles maintain the differences between each meal, serving as all, such me as all such rules do, to keep everything in its place. A cultural analysis would go on to make use of these findings, inquiring into both society and history to find out how they have come to be as they are and what keeps them that way. A social analysis would find out about the effects of age, region, income, occupation, on the rules and the way they are used. Differences of many kinds and in many domains of ordinary life are taken for granted by members of the society without ever elaborating on the underlying argument, even in literate societies with a scientific tradition. How life's domains are ordered is the prime question in structural and cultural analysis. And it is from this perspective that I have looked at practice in our system of land use. Both explicit technical practice and implicit moral practice. That is, to make sense of a large domain of our world, we use a system of differences to characterize, to distinguish categories of land uses, and inevitably, categories of land users. The social order that is, our shared understanding of the appropriate and correct relationships between people is only analytically separable from the technical order of land use. The meanings of such differences, which are those conventional understandings we share implicitly, I have presumed 
to be socially constituted and not given in the nature of things. These conventions, which serve as our natural knowledge, are culture, and they are the proper object of cultural analysis. Each convention comes also to have signs or symbols standing for it, acting as codes or vehicles of the agreed upon meanings. The study of meaning is the province of semantics, and the study of signs is one branch of semantics called semiotics. I have a reading list in my office for anybody who's getting interested in this subject. I'll take questions at the end. Can you hear me? What's going on? Um, and takes its possibility from practical social life. The very issues arising in that practical social life of the domain of metropolitan development are the differences between these very familiar issues, high and low density, social homogeneity and heterogeneity, black and white races, young and old, work and home, renters and owners, newcomers and old timers, localism and regionalism, tradition and change, the present and the future, new property and old. Debating each of these distinctions is part and parcel of choosing among development alternatives, tax policies, zoning provisions, and in the large transportation and population policies. Shared understandings of those differences are used widely, both by scholars and practitioners. How they manifest themselves technically and material, materially is taken as the overt issue in policy making and social science, as well as environmental design. The meanings of each distinction, however, are covert and form the topic of interest to cultural anthropology. As a whole, my book, Everything in Its Place, from which certain of these ideas are taken addresses many long-standing issues of metropolitan development. Here, I want to concentrate on the differences between the categories renter and owner, treating them as both social and cultural categories. That is, they are actually people owning and renting. And as well, there are meanings attaching to the differences between them. To find these meanings, I try to put ideas about each category into context to replace each in the media producing it. That is, those details of practice, ideals, and event, past and present, giving rise to the differences between them. The form of tenure is used by Americans in classification and evaluation in much the same way that race, income, occupation, and education are. The meanings of tenure as a system are decisive in the spatial arrangements of new development, zoning district classifications, building codes governing occupancy, and differing rights under law. More decisive than many objective facts. One principle of this system is that homeowners and renters are conventionally believed to act differently and to have different moral characteristics. Owners are subtle, stable, good citizens, in contrast to renters who are transient, unstable, and pay less attention to their civic duties. The owner category has higher social status than the renter category, in that owning can reduce the import of low income, while renting requires a higher income to overcome its stigma. Look, as an aside, let me just say, the, the many facts there are about owning and renting are not my topic, but let me set them aside by, by reciting just a few. The majority social category is owner. 64.4% of all housing units were owner-occupied in 1973. 
In the last 30 years, it's been the design of housing available for rent has declined by about 40 percentage points. Only more expensive for people with incomes above $10,000 who also plan to stay put for at least three years. Otherwise, renting is a better buy. Internal revenue service provisions for the deduction of mortgage interest and property taxes do not apply to renters who are paying both, but only their landlords may deduct those expenses. Only should, in fact, be seen in quotation marks. The correct general term is home buyer, in that just 40% of all mortgages are paid up. Of all single family houses still mortgaged, 80% of the principal owners are younger than 55. There are many more such facts, but I ask that we suspend our usual interest in them in order to concentrate on the implications we endow them with. I'm discussing ideas about facts, not facts themselves. And of course, I regard these ideas as facts. These are some texts from my interviews discussing renters and owners. Uh, in response to my very open-ended questioning. Quote, when we're getting into a very residential-type neighborhood, largely occupied by homeowners, which are found in Philadelphia, except in the very central part, they just don't consider the apartment dweller as being truly indigenous to the neighborhood. They just don't. A developer says, I would think that lenders would be somewhat reluctant to see a mixture of owners and renters in the same identifiable project. I am not talking about a planned unit development where you've got a rental project on one block and an ownership project on the next block. This is a different kettle of fish. But if you mix the two in the same, well, you can take the same housing type, the same design almost, and segregate the two groups, and you will be okay. But if you mix them, I don't think it works. An appraiser says about any mixing of renters and owners. When you mix them, you are just planting a booby trap. For eventual devaluation, renters and homeowners do not mix well, regardless of what the hope may be. I asked, what happens? There is a decline in the area when renters come in. Another appraiser puts it. I suppose there is a theory that any time you rent, you're bringing the quality of the neighborhood down, because the theory is that anybody who rents is less desirable than someone who owns. Your house is worth less by virtue of the fact that the house on either side of you is leased. Another person speaks of public reactions he has observed among homeowners to apartments next door. I think that the question of acceptability is not so much a question of whether there should be apartments or whether there shouldn't be apartments. It is whether there should be apartments next door to them. I don't think that the people in the subdivisions are objecting to there being apartments in town. They don't have objections to people living in apartments. They just don't want them living next to them. One person spoke about a fairly conventional developer who was willing to take, at that time, extraordinary risks and build a cluster development. Quote, he had a hard time getting financed initially because the whole real estate idea was, well, he had townhouses, opposite apartments, sharing a common parking facility, which we still do to this day because it makes a lot of sense. That was considered to be a problem because you don't mix uses. You don't get them that close together. You do single family over here and apartments over there and townhouses somewhere else, but you keep them separated by green space buffers and some mechanism for making sure that they don't really touch. And I asked, what is the difference do you think between the rental of the apartment and the ownership of the townhouse? No, they were both rental. Treat them both the same, it wouldn't make any difference. Now that text reveals that each tenure category has come to be symbolized by housing types. Single family detached houses, townhouses or row houses, garden apartments, high-rise apartment buildings. Until very recently, with the apartment and townhouse condominium boom, owning has been symbolized only by the detached single-family house. An appraiser classifies the apartments as, quote, reasonably domestic, unquote, but barely so. Quote, Generally, unless we get too far out of the scale, apartments can exist practically next to practically anything. 
As we all know, there's a lot more I want to say. I reasonably domestic atmosphere as opposed to, a, well, apartments would be better next to a bad strip joint than they would next to a light industrial user. The pattern of separation is the basic principle of new development, quoting. Generally speaking, the planners and developers try to keep it from getting all mixed up because their feeling is that the market, people who are buying, don't want the houses mixed up with the apartments. There was a large open tract of land just west of our subdivision, and it was sold, and they're building apartments all over the place, and all the residents got all upset. They extended the street, and they got indignant, and went down to city council and raised hell because all the traffic was going to come through, and all these bad apartment buildings would be using all our very own streets. I think when people are living in apartments and then turn around and buy a house, they have the same kind of feeling. And so it seems to be perpetuated. As a result, I think this attitude has caused the developers to separate the apartments and townhouses from the single-family areas because of the marketing characteristics. End quote. Each category is further freighted with many axioms about the kinds and desirability of people's behaviors. Ownership is widely believed to cause the valued behaviors associated with it. When renters change categories and own, so too, it is believed, will their behavior change. One free of the landlord's right of entry to access it to inspect the premises, and one of three of the customary restrictions in leases against personalizing rented housing. But those are the two most significant differences between owning and renting. It is believed that people will be transformed. Having greater personal power over the family's abode and gaining thereby social identity, autonomy, and self-respect will transform the lesser moral character and unacceptable behavior of tenants. Federal programs subsidizing homeownership for the poor, for example, have been designed on this very assumption. These beliefs are founded on owning as tenure and not on the differences between houses and apartments in terms of the personal efficacy so often enhanced by the space and room arrangements of larger housing built only for sale. The first significant cultural difference between renters and owners is their chronological position. Renters and owners are each at opposite ends of what is, to, what is believed to be not only a natural, but a correct sequence of life. That is, quoting one of my informants, the straight line. It is put this way, quoting, I think there is a definite difference between owners and renters. I think even renters and owners recognize those differences. I think there is a negative syndrome against renting by people who own. It's always no matter, even the price range doesn't seem to make that much difference. But the guy who owns feels that he has made a commitment and he has done the right thing. He has done the thing that he was, you know, his parents told him he ought to do. And he has followed the straight line and he's, you know, he's doing the right thing. Deviations from that straight line are termed compromises. Cool. Where the American dream for the majority of people is probably still to have a traditional detached house. And you might not be able to afford that when you first get married, and you live in a compromised situation until you can achieve that step. And so, if we looked at that average pattern today, we will probably say that still is the majority dream or desire. And so, you still have the move up pattern, where you might go from an, from an apartment to a better apartment to a house, or from an apartment to a townhouse to a house. One person I interviewed involved in civic and development enterprises said, quoting, there is a sort of homeowner's ethic that puts a very high value on you when you become an owner. That's sort of a step up the ladder of social as well as economic standing. I think I've observed that in the less affluent stage of the community, particularly in the black community. There's a great deal of pride even in the ownership of very modest dwellings. And people will go to great lengths to display to the public that they, in fact, own that house, even though it may not be much of a house. They'll put up fences and they'll plant flowers and they'll paint the front of the house, even if they don't paint the rest of it, in order to display the fact that they are independent. They have reached a certain stage in their life 
where they can tell the world that this is theirs. So, the root chronology is not only natural, but it is moral as well. In 1935, Helen and Robert Lind documented Middletown's values, finding them to be expressed in these terms, quoting, by and large, Middletown believes that progress is the law of life, that the natural and orderly processes of progress should be followed, that the strongest and the best should survive, for that is the law of nature, after all, that the poor boy to president way is the American way to get ahead, that the family is a sacred institution and the fundamental institution of our society, that the monogamous family is the outcome of evolution from lower forms of life and is the final divinely ordained form, that home ownership is a good thing for the family and also makes for good citizenship. Unquote. One finds the latter as the natural progression through the stages of the life cycle, from renting an apartment or townhouse, duplex, or attached bow house, to owning it to another step, any one of those, along the way to the ultimate rung, that of owning a single family detached house. In taking the latter rung by rung, the movement is altogether upward, an evolutionary progress toward salvation moving from lower forms to a final or divinely ordained form. The belief in natural progression is elaborated into the ladder of social and economic standing climbed gradually stage by stage. Apartments, together with the transients living in them, are an intermediate step up the ladder, a compromised situation. One person put it, but there is an order of things that people strive for, and their arrival is announced by the house with lawn and trees and flowers. Now, the middle term data point to a sacred quality endowing both the family and its home, sacred in the sense of being set apart from the mundane and having a distinctive aura. In the hierarchy of land uses, the category single family detached stands at the top often designated in zoning ordinances by the letter A or the number one. And all those below the apex partake of less of a sacred quality in a certainly descending order that locates apartments at the bottom. When one follows those natural and orderly processes of progress, if one engages in competition and gets ahead, then one can achieve the ideal family existence in a single family house, fulfilling both the American creed and the American dream without compromise. A recent case in the United States Supreme Court attests to the currency of these implicit American meanings. In 1975, in the village of Belter versus Forest, the court decided that a single-family house in a single-family zoning district may not be occupied by more than two unrelated persons. The majority opinion put it, quoting, a quiet place where yards are wide, people few, and motor vehicles restricted are legitimate guidelines in a land use project addressed to family needs. The police power is not confined to elimination of filth, stench, and unhealthy places. It is ample to lay out zones where family values, youth values, and the blessings of quiet seclusion and clean air make the area a sanctuary for people. End quote. The opinion rests on connotations of the sacred. Single family residential areas provide blessings and are a sanctuary. Justice Thurgood Marshall's dissent provides a contrast with what, with what I call the mundane. He argues that freedom of association is limited by this exclusion of groups. That the, the whole argument was with groups living in a single family zone. The majority opinion implies that a family of 20, according to Justice Marshall, could therefore live together and generate a high level of traffic and noise. But those nuisances would go unnoticed compared to the din produced by a group of 20 unrelated people. In my terms, their nuisances are earthly, while those of the family, according to the logic of the majority, are as the productions of a divinely ordained family, ethereal. 
context of this, of what unifies people socially and spatially, is that they are moving up the rungs of the ladder at the same time. That although there is a certain range of similar socioeconomic status, it is, quote, somewhat of a spectrum, but not the total thing that tends to pull them together. The determinant of mutual interest, as Kirsten says, are where you came from, what you're doing, and where you're going. This is what tends to bring people together in a group, end quote. At the same time, however, many texts often describe renters as transient, unstable, not thrifty, without pride, immature, lower class, not full-fledged citizens, indifferent to property maintenance, sneaky, a source of unrest, all appropriate characterizations. These axioms do not frame transiency as the expression of improving one's job, as in where you're going, or the deepening of skills, as in what you're doing, or as any other positive feature of progressing. Uh, renters have to be doubly thrifty, in fact, uh, to make this ideology work out, because they have to save up their down payment at exactly the same time as they are continuing to pay rent. On the contrary, the emphasis is on distinctly moral or character inferiorities. The common litany of homeowners facing the prospect of new apartments or higher density housing nearby is they will lower our property values. It is possible to show that the economic effect is in fact quite the opposite. But spatial proximity is the overwhelming concern. Apartments are all right but not next door. Even a new kind of single family housing will bring that outcry. One developer told me that he had to assure the owners of $60,000 houses that people buying $40,000 houses in a quadruplex arrangement next door were average human beings. Quoting him, uh, a quadruplex is a central foyer off of which there are four separately owned units, but people enter through one door. To understand more about these beliefs and assumptions, let us turn to the second significant cultural difference between renters and owners. It rests with that movement between categories so essential to these American conceptions of life's proper chronology. Transition is a universal characteristic of life, marked often by rites of passage. People traverse social time and social space by leaving one category to enter another. Van Gennep, an anthropologist who wrote in the early years of this century, analyzed the structure of these rites of passage in a wide variety of societies and found three major phases. Separation from the category one is in, transition itself, and incorporation into a different category. Each stage takes its meaning from a contrast he found, one that is always culturally defined depending on where you are, between people who are, in my terms, safe and dangerous. Those considered safe are those who are settled, who have not changed categories in a while. They remain in some taken for granted status. Those on the move, in the process of becoming but not yet settled into a new status, the pregnant woman not yet in the new category of mother, the traveler out of reach of an established social place. <clears throat> Their in-between status endows them with, as Van Gennep puts it, powers, mysteries, or dangers disturbing the life of society and the individual. Rituals often separate those in and in-between status from others, both temporally and spatially, thus cushioning their socially harmful effects. Some of the distinctions between dangerous and safe people appear in American social thought about the life cycle, which is defined as the movement from a less to a more safe status. Each stage is correspondingly manifested in land use categories, and each is evaluated by its proximity to the apex the safest because there is no better earthly status beyond it.
This was Masada's arrival, as my informants put it. American residential land use patterns embody these stages as natural evolutionary processes, thus symbolizing the American ideology. Correct social timing is a powerful ideology governing prohibitions on housing location. The symbols of each stage can't really touch, for if they do, it is just planting a booby trap, because differences in housing types are equally differences in social time. What is out of place spatially is out of place chronologically. No matter how orderly renters' progression through life may actually be, the opprobrium attaching to them arises from their category itself, by definition, one of transition. The opprobrium extends to any category betwixt and between, that is, any category not wholly one thing or another, a mixed category. Category blurring is in the transitional mode, thereby spelling danger. What is this danger? Van Gennep points to one answer. The dangers are believed to have the power to redefine those now safe back into an unsettled status, no longer one that can be taken for granted. Rites of passage are performed to cushion the disturbance, as Van Gennep puts it, of the dangerous transitional stage. These rites equilibrate the socially disruptive effects to bring about the final stage of incorporation into the new social status or group, making all safe again. Our ritual for cushioning the disturbance brought by changes of land use is the local public hearing, at which the dangers to owners by renters are in that common litany they will lower our property values. The home buyer's moral chronology is disturbed and turned on its end when there are apartments or anything other than single-family detached housing next door. Many buyers, we know, are overcommitted and house poor, and they may fear being unmasked as renters in disguise. In between categories focuses attention on category boundaries. They have a major role in social thought, for they are equally the rules of social order, serving to keep everything in its place. Edwin Leach, a British anthropologist, proposes that there is, quoting, an innate sacred taboo quality of all boundaries which derives from their ambiguity. They are, end quote, they are ambiguous because in mediating between clear-cut categories, any boundary necessarily partakes of the different qualities of each. Being at the edge, it necessarily collects bits from each category it lies between. As Leach puts it, quote, boundaries become dirty by definition and we devote a great deal of effort to keeping them clean, just so that we can preserve confidence in our category system, end quote. Further, if indeed all the so-called dirt is removed from a boundary, then its property as interface is obscured, for without boundaries, categories have no force. Hence that paradox commonly found in rites of passage that those people and objects in the intervals of being not quite one thing or another exert special power and are regarded as sacred, dangerous, and dirty all at once. Mary Douglas, another British anthropologist, analyzes a number of ethnographic reports from primitive, preliterate societies, and concludes that whatever is unclassifiable or whatever falls outside the boundaries of a category is regarded as socially polluting and dangerous. Quoting, when moral rules are obscure or contradictory, there is a tendency for pollution beliefs to simplify or clarify the pointed issue. End quote. Just think about the difficulties presented by borders and adjacent margins in, in any environmental design problem. Expressways, large parks, large land users. Now there is a figure that appears in myths and folk tales the world over called the trickster. These figures appear whenever there is change, transition, and trouble. They are found in the literature of all the world's groups. They live in the interstices, 
Just one anthropologist summarizes the amoral traits of these spirits and gods. Destructive, creative, farcical, ironic, energetic, suffering, lecherous, submissive, defiant, but always unpredictable. The invincible child of uncertain sexual status. Self-will, caprice, and lust impel them. He has read a lot of the literature. Folklorists and literary scholars have been interested in tricksters as representatives of those, quote, areas between categories, between what is animal and what is human, what is natural and what is cultural. Trickster and his tales exemplify this preoccupation, for at the center of his existence is the power derived from his ability to live interstitially, to confuse and to escape the structure of society and the order of cultural things. These tales attribute to tricksters the same sort of out-of-bound sexuality so commonly attributed to blacks, swinging singles, gay divorcees, merry widows, all regarded as American interstitial categories. The standout figure of our folklore is another personification of the universal trickster, in our case created by white Americans, the American national jester, as one historian calls him. One of my texts adds the renter to the catalog of trickster figures. Quote, Transient type people always create unrest amongst people who tend to be more stable. So I think there's a social thing, you know, that the other guy's got to be somebody to watch a little bit because he is going to pick up in the middle of the night and steal away, end quote. Firm categories, by definition, entail the reciprocal possibility of being between them. And in American society, I find three sources of categorical certainty. The first I have been discussing. The ideology of a correct chronology of life leading to salvation, such that there are definitive stages to be between, manifested in housing types that symbolize one's moral place along that path. The next are legally defined statuses and relationships. To become a socially recognized person, moving from minor to the full majority of adulthood, attaining the right to vote, to drink, to marry, these are definitive and prescribed categories. One is either in or out. So if you with relationships def defined on a legal basis, such as marriage or group membership, in contrast to those relationships that are informal or customary. The third source of in-between categorical status goes out of cultural conventions about the boundaries between domestic production and industrial production, a strict separation of the categories of home and work reflected fastidiously in land use regulations. These three domains, the ideological, the legal, and the economic, generate the status of so-called problematic social categories. Blacks, women, and renters do not have their legal ties to the state completely in place. Blacks still do not have established civil rights. Women hope that the Equal Rights Amendment will tie them as firmly into society as men are. And renters keep waiting for tenant equality in the eyes of the laws governing allowable income tax deductions, and so on. Their incomplete legal status keeps them marginal and dangerous, to be sure. But something else about them must account for their originally oblique and interstitial cultural status. That is, the laws themselves came from somewhere. I have been suggesting the sources of the renter's dangerous power sociologically, ideologically, and economically. I can speak similarly about women and blacks. Women move between biological phases with monthly menstruation, with the visible changes of pregnancy and birth, and with menopause. That women's minds are changeable is a stereotype capturing the blurred quality of their category. 
Their offspring, with whom they are identified, are in continuous transition, growing up. Blacks since the Civil War and the 14th Amendment have changed social categories altogether. First, from being defined as non-humans, that is, property, into humans. Their very being, however, signified a blurred or mixed category, because their skin color had come to symbolize the difference between property and humanity. Black persons was a contradiction in terms, culturally. Second, their danger to social order was compounded by another category change, from slave to free, from being socially and physically fixed to being mobile. Equally, do children partake of many of these same meanings, for in growing and changing, they are dangerously uncategorizable for very long. The elderly, too, are segregated or excluded as one social response to the disturbing mysteries of the final transition to death. Categories believed to be in social and chronological limbo are consigned to spatial limbo. The texts I have gathered suggest that those likely to be without a legal tie to any other person or who, or who are incomplete social persons are to be collected together spatially, for splitting anomalies in space and, space and in social time will disrupt social safety. Renters are axiomatically thought to be also single, divorced, black, and elderly. Most of these categories are also greatly hindered in getting mortgages, thus perpetu perpetuating renting as the only tenure state as they are, with perfect circularity, permitted to have. The bitter public controversies reported regularly in the newspapers surrounding housing sites for poor, elderly, or handicapped people. The handicapped are incomplete persons, and thereby signify a mixed category. And for people le needing to live halfway between freedom and prisons, between freedom and prisons or hospitals, are founded on unspoken ideas about their contaminating powers. Students, with or without the fact of loud parties, are also not exempt. They are also a transitional category, par excellence. The term for neighborhoods on the edge of downtowns is gray areas, reflecting their cultural status as neither one thing nor the other. And in fact, associated with tricksters in this, in this vast literature is the combination of a black and white symbolism, the gesture figure that's so often associated with kings, the black and white harlequin, uh, picked up the symbol. Collecting in one place, these, these gray areas collect in one place the morally marginal, alcoholics, prostitutes, illegal businesses, porno shops, and criminals. Central cities, in housing these categories defined as marginal, black, single people, elderly widows and widowers, renters, they find themselves politically isolated. The third source of firm categories in American society is the economic, home and work, love.